Hello, uh, I'm Jay Ladd. I'm presenting from Orlando Health Department of Emergency Medicine. I'm a senior associate program director as well as one of the faculty there. Um, this uh, topic is sort of near and dear to us um, as we sort of went through a transformation process over the last three years in our organization that had a huge impact on our residents and our sort of uh, academic mission. Um, Catchy title, and what worlds collide mentoring residents through the maze of hospital metrics. I know we've got standing room only in this room, so please uh, keep the, the noise down to a very low level. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, you can read those uh, objectives, but really the main point here was for us to be able to maintain our academic mission, all the while sort of entertaining and helping our hospital and organization meet metrics that they sort of deemed as very important and high level um, for their progress and success in the future. And really being able to be a part of that was very important to us. As a, as a bit of background, um, like I said, we've, I've been there about 20 years. We're a level one trauma center. I see about 100,000 patients in our main ED and we have a separate PEDS hospital and OBGYN hospital that totals about 200,000 patients on campus. Um, we also function as the county hospital, so sort of have the same sort of issues with um, patients who uh, are unable to pay for care coming to us um, to add to sort of the fact that our hospital is a not-for-profit but isn't a, a true county hospital. Um, in 2017, our new CEO, who uh, most of us think very highly of, sort of wanted to make sure that we um, highlighted why we're the community hospital and sort of take our strengths and take them to the next level. Um, obviously, these are admirable qualities, and we wanted to take part in that process, but having been there through three CEOs myself, I'd seen this sort of rhetoric come up by multiple times, and um, each time sort of ended in failure or you know, sort of lack of planning, lack of goals. Uh, we thought this was an opportunity for us as members of the academic community to show our worth and our ability to, to sort of contribute in the process of the hospital reaching metrics. Metrics are just a way of measuring <clears throat> excuse me, measuring uh, behaviors, attitudes uh, that an organization portrays in reaching its goals. Um, it's a way of looking at employees and how they do their, perform their tasks and how that organization meets their goals. Um, I think for most of us that are in academics, these are the metrics we really focus on over the years. Um, things like policies and procedures, systems-based practice, um, issues in professionalism, making sure we have caring doctors, who know how to behave in a hospital. Um, bedside procedures, performing intubations, lumbar punctures, central lines, bedside ultrasound. Um, with the ROC and sort of the advent of milestones, we sort of have our own labeled metrics that sometimes can become a headache, but also are an important part of the progress of our residents. And probably most importantly, sort of the medical knowledge that needs to be translated over for our young residents to end up being successful attendings. Behind all of this really is probably the most significant metric, and that's patient care. And this is where academics and hospital administration, I think, can meet one another, because at the, if the end goal is to provide good patient care, um, it's pretty easy to see that where both um, sort of sets of people um, have a common goal to reach towards. Uh, looking up sort of industry common metrics, the top 10 metrics, you're gonna see things that a lot of you have heard of, length of stay, um, time to see a doc, um, patient satisfaction, physician performance, sort of the bottom line dollar things like bed occupancy, operating margin. A lot of these go in one ear and out the other for most of us. Um, but other things, sort of, sort of the federally mandated metrics that CMS puts out, or MIPS, which may affect 5% of the Medicaid dollars, sort of catch the attention of anyone, everyone involved. There are certainly organizations out there, many of whom are not for profit, some of whom are for profit, that sort of have uh, created checklist of metrics that you know hospitals hope to reach in order to be deemed quality hospitals um, and you know despite the fact that many of us may or may not agree with it these are the things that people in the c-suite are looking at and sort of striving towards um, and then there's the ever popular patient satisfaction for many of us this is the bane of our existence um, for others it's sort of a, a source of pride um, while we may not agree on how it's done where it's done and why it's done I think we can all agree that we want our patients to have a good experience. Um, in looking at our own metrics, we understood that our residents and trainees really understood 
that things like infection control, readmission, uh, making sure you're following sort of best practices with regards to STEMI, strokes, all fit in with the clinical picture. There wasn't a whole lot of buy-in that needed to be had in these cases. I think the two areas we found that really we were going to need to make an impact in were throughput and to a lesser extent patient experience. Um, these are harder to grasp. So we had to go through a process. Um, and that process was pretty simple. Um, for our organization, um, in 2017, we had a bed, or sorry, arrival to bed upstairs time of about 550 minutes in our ED. A lot of that was due to the fact that we're a typical sort of teaching trauma hospital and that we were often holding 30 patients for greater than six, eight hours waiting on beds upstairs. In a 75 bed ED, as m many of you probably can relate to, um, that really slows down your progress. Um, our goal was to hit 273 minutes in a year. Um, pretty lofty goal if you look at basically taking the time down in half. We all love metrics, right? I take a look at that and I say, uh, you gotta be kidding me. Um, but in embarking on this journey, we really had to take a look at things and, and embrace the fact that in order to compete in this profession, to do a good job, we have to embrace metrics. Um, we don't have to like them. We have to embrace the fact that they're a daily part of our lives. In fact, when I got off my Delta flight yesterday, my first email was from Delta asking me how much I liked the peanuts they served me and if everyone from the gay agent to the pilot was friendly and gave me a smile. That's just the world we live in, and I think the moment we sort of realize that and are able to translate that over to those that learn under us, the easier it is to, to make some movement here. Uh, in embarking on this um, journey, we really needed to sort of create a system, and, and before we even did that, we wanted to sort of take into account the obstacles we might run into. Um, I think most of us agree bedside teaching is sort of the first thing people think of that are, is going to be affected um, when you're sort of trying to push patients through more quickly, uh, appease them. Um, it often takes time away from actually training our residents. Um, you know, you could take this as a problem, you can take this as an opportunity to create a solution. Uh, for us, we took a very different approach. We decided that we were going to go to administration at the highest level and come up with solutions ahead of time and present those solutions as how we, as a program in emergency medicine, could help them reach their lofty goals. Uh, alongside bedside teaching really is, is messaging. Um, we have to get their proper message off to, to our faculty as well as the residents and fellows. Um, why does this matter to them? I think in thinking through this, we understand that a lot of this affects patient care, your ability to even have a job. This is part of the training. We, we brag about the fact that our program, when interviewees come in, that our program gets you street ready. You come in here, take care of critical patients, you see a large number of patients, you have your procedures, but at the same time, you also are able to understand the real world medicine, the sort of things that come in and out of administration, uh, the, the, the issues you deal with on a daily basis as an emergency physician. In doing so, we really needed to make sure we uh, strove to account for physician satisfaction, make sure everyone was comfortable with what we're doing and empowering them to sort of um, have a say in how this process goes. I think at the end of this, we found that a lot of our residents um, saw this as a, as a micro niche where they could sort of have a strength that set them apart from a lot of other graduates that are freshly out of residency. And this also gave us an opportunity to, to mentor uh, faculty mentors in that they were able to create another niche and sort of reaching out to residents that they otherwise would not have done. Sort of the third big obstacle in our minds was wellness. This has become a hot button topic. Um, wellness sort of often uh, is hindered by obstacles, by feeling like you have no power to do things. We saw this as an opportunity for us as a teaching program to take this to the next level. We created a curriculum for our interns during their first orientation month in which they uh, interacted with uh, several of us emergency physicians as well as our nurses to get to know them but also sort of have a, a feel of how our patients experience an emergency depart department visit. We created open forum discussions in conference time in which administrators are invited to come to sort of experience um, the questions that our residents had about things like throughput or MIPS um, and really I think opened the eyes of everyone involved and in sort of where we were and where we were headed. Um, in doing so I think we really created some, some filled in some knowledge gaps uh, we were able to, to update people on what was going on in medicine, but also 
I think we found that we needed to provide very regular update, updates, and I think our resident leaders were a big part of that. Um, again, as I said, I think empowering our residents and trainees in this process was key to all of this. Um, involving them, getting them FaceTime with admin. We invited our, this is two years ago, we invited our COO as well as president of the hospital, and we're a fairly large organization, a $4 billion organization, to our second year retreat, which is held at one of our uh, attendings' houses, um, to sort of come in and give their thoughts on uh, what admin is looking forward to as far as moving towards and what their goals are. And they sat there for one hour and answered some very difficult questions from some very intelligent residents. But I think everyone left with a greater respect and a better understanding of, you know, there's a lot of similarities in what we're striving for. And certainly there's some differences, but I think there's an opportunity for us to contribute. Um, I think through this we were able to create some innovation. Um, we did some small projects on things like emergency department clinical concierge, which is basically taking the uh, mundane task of following up on x-rays, making sure things are getting done out of the hands of the skilled providers, our nurses and physicians, and really putting them in the hands of um, Clinitex who could do this much better and much more quickly, um, at the same time allowing for more time for procedures, bedside teaching, and so forth. And I think through all of this, what we discovered is reinforcing the wins was very important. Even if it's a small daily win, we hit this number today and we killed all our records. Um, we also set a long-term goal of, listen, August 2018, they're going to basically grade us. We're going to celebrate this. No matter what happens, we're going to throw a shindig at the program director's house. And we're going to celebrate this. We're going to have some good food, and we're going to sort of, uh, you know, revisit what we've done and how, how far we've come. We have to keep in mind that our patients aren't our only customers in this scenario. It really is our residents, our students, our trainees. Um, and if we keep that in mind, it makes it a lot easier to move, move through this process. I think once we've sort of identified these obstacles, um, our next step was really aligning ourselves with our hospital administration. Um, we uh, set up meetings with the CEO, the president, um, all the way down to medical directors, um, quality directors, nursing operations, to sort of get our residents involved, get their feet in, see where they fit in, see what their needs were. Um, in doing so, you sort of look at a typical org chart. This is not specific to my organization, but um, it really just shows a hierarchy of where people answer to in any typical corporation. This is a pretty small org chart. Ours is like four pages um, long. What you won't find are any of your resident sort of leadership positions or even general resident positions on these org charts in general. Um, what we really were hoping for is our resident officers to sort of have a position where they could reach out to quality officers, reach out to the senior vice presidents, and really reach to the president. We work as a team in the emergency department at all times, right? We, we, we're on first name basis with our nurses, our staff, our paramedics. Um, we wanted that same relationship reaching, extending all the way up to the president. And we thought if we had that comfort with one another, it would make it a lot easier for us to provide realistic input um, and really help them achieve what they needed to get done and allow us to maintain what we needed to maintain. So how does GME really fit in to sort of hospital metrics and um, sort of metric-driven care? Um, that's a tough one. I think we all learn, but the, the key players have to be involved. That involves administration, that involves your own faculty. A number of our faculty are sort of burnt out from the idea of sort of community medicine, the, the metrics, you know, I have to make patients happy by you know, giving them narcotics, things like that. Those sort of attitudes had to go away in order for us to achieve success. And then we had to really reach our residents, who really are our most important player in this. Um, again, there's a number of administrative positions. This is just a small list of people that we really got in touch with and involved in our process. This slide is, is one of my most important slides. And that's because when I use the term senior leadership, you're probably all thinking, you know, you just talk about the COO, or a faculty member that's been here for 40 years. No, this is our resident um, leadership. This is really the third year class. Um, for the past two years, our third year class really, um, as a whole, has taken on um, this challenge and come up very strong. They've been very involved. They've split duties. We've created positions within our residency that are recognized within administration as being important cogs in the wheel that makes the hospital successful. Uh, it, really, the idea behind it is you have a lot of these positions on, you know, you're right, faculty positions that exist in most hospitals. What we're able to do is create resident quality officers, patient satisfaction champions, looking at our chief residents, 
just our patient care uh, committees and have them create a fine meshwork that sort of laid the foundation for hopefully a successful transformation. Yeah, and the faculty really need to be reinvigorated, and I think the easiest way to do that is this is an opportunity to mentor the residents. Um, we are able to create positions for young faculty. I think this is very important as you try to succeed in things like this. Give ownership to your faculty. We created throughput champions, satisfaction, sort of experience champions. Uh, this created opportunities for unique lectures, um, such as the one I'm giving here. Uh, it also allowed us to have an opportunity to be, have a presence mo both locally in Florida as well as nationally in sort of these discussions at a bigger uh, picture sort of scenario. In talking about our residents, what we really wanted for them is for, for them to be able to have a seat at the table. But not this table. This is the typical table we sit at. This table. It's the boardroom, right? If you're not sitting at the table for dinner, you're dinner. And this is a very important concept I think a number of them sort of walked away with. Having that say, having the ability to have an interaction with people that can move and change things is key to success and also key to satisfaction. We just sort of took a look of, our, of the impact on a, a position we created in 2016 called the Chief Resident Quality Officer. In 2016, it was one of our chief residents. Um, you know, he basically drew the short straw and ended up being the quality officer, while the other two chief residents sort of got to avoid that. By the time 17 came along, we actually created two positions that were brand new, and this year we had three um, positions on top of our three chief residents in a program of 18 residents a year. So it's really grown, it's been very successful. Um, of the eight people, including this year, four entered fellowship, four ended up in positions in Texas, North Carolina, um, um, and, and of course Florida, and I think uh, one of our graduates, sit, or soon to be graduates sitting here, got his job in North Carolina at a place that doesn't give jobs to new graduates, and part of what they noticed in his application was he had served as chief resident quality officer. When I interviewed him, he had greater insight into sort of hospital administration, how things work, than many of his faculty and physicians that are working under him. And this is a direct conversation. Um, one of our graduates went straight to a quality officer position in a pretty large organization. Another one of ours ended up being sort of the quality assurance EMS director. So again, these led to sort of opportunities that otherwise would not have been um, probably met early on in their careers. I asked for some quotes. These are busy slides, I apologize. But I thought it was important to sort of get a feel for what uh, people who had served as quality officers um, had gained from this experience. Uh, Alexa Rodriguez, who uh, works for our EMS as a director, basically saw this as a, gave her an opportunity in Orange County, but also gave her multiple opportunities in other hospital systems for leadership positions very early. Um, she also saw new ways to analyze and improve problems as opposed to the traditional way you were sort of taught in school. Uh, Drew Bienvenu, who's one of our current uh, ultrasound fellows who did, was the chief resident quality officer the year before, um, his biggest takeaway is he thought he saw how important it was to have a seat at the table to sort of be able to have these discussions and sort of coordinating things with administrative goals. I think an important side effect as we sort of try to focus in on how does this affect our academic endeavors is we were able to come up with a number of scholarly products um, that I think we're very proud of on top of the clinical ones we do on a regular basis. Uh, we have projects looking at um, patients left, who are left early, um, looking at patient experience, looking at throughput. We have a hospital uh, research competition that focuses on quality. Uh, for the last four years, I sort of pulled the data and we had 20% of all the abstracts came out of the Department of Emergency Medicine. We had six top five finishes over those four years and really um, had the number one abstract two years in a row. Um, out of this, we've had about 10 national presentations. There's about three presentations at this conference alone that's basically fruit from the labor involved with sort of our process of going through hospital metrics. So this all sounds great. I mean, this really has sort of been a boon to our academic program, but, but how do you measure success? I think administration measures success very differently. That all sounds great. For sort of for the, the, the websites, but you know, were we able to affect change? Was this a positive thing? This is one of my favorite slides. Um, I took a picture off one of our GIMBA boards. Um, GIMBA board, for those of you who don't know, GIMBA meetings are sort of a, you know, a gathering of all those involved, sort of the stakeholders um, around a board traditionally, and sort of you go through the process of breaking down processes, celebrating successes. But our CEO, uh, put this slide up and I thought, or this piece of paper up, and I took a picture of it very quickly. Um, this looks at provider to decision emit, so not door to decision emit, which is our real thing, but 
the beginning part of this, the, over on the right side, my right side, was 2017. If you, you can see that the average time was about 400 minutes. But what's probably more important is you see the huge amount of variability, up to even 700 minutes. Then somewhere around early 2018, that variability disappeared. Um, and you saw our, our mean times drop down about 130 minutes, 140 minutes. That blue arrow sort of indicates what our CEO really wanted to focus on. He said that is the moment in time we had full engagement from our emergency medicine residency program. He said that in a room full of about 100 people. Um, to me, that we had reached a milestone that we didn't think we were going to reach. The second highest ranking person in the hospital was advocating for the fact that a GME program had helped them reach a goal that seemed unattainable, at least for the last two decades I've been there. Looking at some other metrics, they sent me these slides. They were excited that we were doing this topic. ED visits have shot up from about 7,000 to 9,000 in, in less than two years, and this is per month. At the same time, our length of stay has gone down significantly. If you look at patients who leave without treatment, which is a very common metric that hospitals follow, we're falling under 1% on a regular basis. Before, we were embarrassed at our 3 to 4% range. I mean, this has completely changed the way our patients were cared for. So what's the impact on this? There, TJ Randall's going to be presenting this uh, later this week at this conference, so I don't want to steal his thunder. But at the same time, um, he did give me permission to share a couple of things. We did a pre-post sort of survey and a look at resident productivity, focused on the 30-year residents, really, for productivity. We found that resident productivity went up post our efforts, which makes sense. More patients were coming through. Um, there's not as many bed holes. You're a lot less frustrated. At the same time, what we found is they rated bedside teaching, wellness, and patient care as being statistically insig insignificantly changed. And in fact, there's probably a trend towards a being more positive process. Um, our CEO wanted to be involved, and he sent me a long email. And this is a very shortened version of sort of what his thought process was um, through this whole throughput thing. I don't want to read the whole thing to you, and you can take the time if you're a fast reader, but I love his first sentence. We should have had them, which is our residents, engaged from the very beginning. Almost every patient seen in our emergency department is seen by a resident. The ability to engage them in the effort for whole hospital throughput, not ED throughput, was a real deflection point for us in our improvement. Um, and his last line is, is wonderful. The punchline is you can't get there without full support and engagement of your residents. So what are our lessons learned? Um, if I'm really going to hammer something in, I've, I've said a lot, 20 minutes, it's really tough to get all this in. Um, what are the things you should walk away from? If you're going through this process yourself or you're just trying to improve it, I think some of the things you'll learn is, um, especially when dealing with a large number of people, early failures that occur are often due to communication. We found that once our residents really got involved, we're helpful in updating everyone, utilizing constant reminders through multiple sort of outlets, um, making this patient-centered, but also celebrating small successes. We were able to achieve buy-in much more quickly. Our organization creates scorecards that sort of every day list out all our metrics that they're looking at from time to seeing a doctor to you know, time spent after admission was created to going upstairs. Um, we didn't show that to them every day. That really probably would inundate them. But at the same time, when we had a huge success, a great day where we saw 350 patients yet killed it in the times, we took the time to email that out or at least post it somewhere for elder residents to sort of take notice and see that we could be successful at this and also to show them appreciation of what they've done. Um, we had other initiatives looking at ultrasound IV, which greatly reduced um, the use of PIC lines, central lines, all of which take countless hours to do in patients who are difficult sticks. Our residents were the leaders in this, along with our fac ultrasound faculty. They really changed how quickly we were able to get IVs in patients who otherwise were often, you know, take two, three, four hours just to get blood worker IVs in place. Uh, we also found that satisfaction, patient satisfaction is, does not equate to unhappiness for us. Um, after looking through the literature, we found that phone call follow-ups were um, brought a lot of satisfaction and wellness to, to our providers or to providers in general. And so through one of our residents, uh, Katie Pearson, who's going to be one of our third years, uh, we sort of have embarked on an adventure of asking that some of the follow-ups that we do for ROC purposes anyway be patient follow-ups where you make phone calls to patients, a handful of patients that you see over a week. Um, I think that gives you real-time feedback. It also gives you a lot of satisfaction. Most patients are generally very happy with the care they receive. And I think the biggest lesson for us, people in my position as an APD, was 
we have to maintain our role as listeners, supporters of the residents. Let some of the other people be the bad guys in this one. Um, this is very important for them to understand that we have their back above and beyond all of the other things that are thrown our way. And by maintaining that, I think it keeps the trust alive and allows us to thrive. I think from a bigger perspective, what our administration learned that a lot of us all sort, sort of already knew is this throughput initiative, a lot of, most of these initiatives when you look at metrics are really a whole hospital effort. It's not the ED's fault every time. When you're holding 35 patients and patients are filing in 20 at a time every hour, you know, things are going to back up. Things aren't going to go well. Patients are going to be hap unhappy when they waited for four hours for me to tell them that all they have is a virus and they don't need a CAT scan. Um, but by holding the entire, entirety of all the stakeholders accountable, integrating them in a process such as our GEMBA where, like I said, there's 50 to 100 people sitting in a room every Friday, breaking down what the housekeepers are doing all the way up to what the, the administrators are doing to improve the process. I think the, I think improvement is much easier to be had. Our residents were involved with this on a regular basis. Um, and I think what we found most importantly with all this is you need to have experts in operations who can provide real data. At first, we sort of got things shoved in our face that were based off of no real data. And as we went through this process and these um, times were broken down and people really looked into things, uh, we realized that a lot of this um, could be done if we're given data and we had an expert sort of help us operate. We have a very, we're very fortunate with our CEO as well as several of our emergency physicians who've taken lead roles in this process. So again, I love this quote. I don't have much else to say. I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, um, we have till noon apparently because there's no one else speaking here till noon. So. <laughs>